So, Phantom of the Opera, Aspects of Love, The Wizard of Oz, Evita, Love Never Dies, Sunset Boulevard? I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. Lloyd Webber. All within the next few months. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a theatre pundit, content creator, critic, based here in the UK, and I like talking about all things theatre here on YouTube. Today we're going to be talking about Summer in the West End, in which the theme is the musicals of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yes, this year there are so many Lloyd Webber revivals and productions and concerts that you can see in London. And while Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber has always had something of a strong presence within the UK theatre scene, it feels like an enormity of productions that we're getting all at once. It's like the Andrew Lloyd Webber bus, and all of them are pulling into the station right now. So if you are a fan of Lloyd Webber musicals, and I know there are many of you out there, this is a fantastic year for you. And if, like me, you're a little bit of a cynic, then you might be wondering why this is. We're going to talk about why this might be happening in today's video, as well as about all of the productions that are coming this summer. So stay tuned to find out about the six Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals you can see this year in the UK. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for more theatre news, reviews, and all sorts of stagey content. You can also follow me on other social media platforms like Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. So let's talk about it. Which Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals can you see this year in the West End? So I feel like there is not a person alive who does not know that you can see The Phantom of the Opera in the West End. And yet, there's been so much talk about it closing on Broadway, I feel like that might have just eclipsed the fact that it is still running in London. When I went to Broadway, there were so many people commenting on my video saying, why aren't you going to see the original production of Phantom of the Opera uh, before it gets ousted from the Majestic Theatre? You can see, like, the original version. And I have seen the original version. I saw it years ago at Her Majesty's Theatre in the West End, now in a slightly reduced but largely similar staging at the recently renamed His Majesty's Theatre, because we have a king now. But yes, Phantom of the Opera lovers, fans with a PH, you can still see Phantom of the Opera in the West End at His Majesty's Theatre, its original home. The show currently stars Holly Ann Hull, who has graduated to full-time in the role, having been the alternate for the past year. She's one of my favourite Christines I have ever seen. She is vocally resplendent. And currently haunting the theatre as the Phantom is John Robbins, who recently finished playing Jean Valjean in the West End production of Les Miserables. He is a veteran West End performer whose career has really been going from illustrious strength to strength in recent years. I haven't been to see his Phantom yet, but I am quite eager to, because I think he's a tremendous talent and also a lovely and down-to-earth guy when you get to chat with him. And I've heard some very exciting things from people who have been to see him already, so I am very much looking forward to his performance. But we know all of this already. We know that the Phantom of the Opera is continuing to run in the West End, even though the show has closed on Broadway. Let me tell you about some other Android Webber musicals running this summer that you might not know about. Next up, we have Aspects of Love, a slightly less known musical uh, featuring the same lyricist as the Phantom of the Opera, Charles Hart, as well as the lyricist Don Black. This production recently opened at the Lyric Theatre and has had some polarizing reviews. Some people thought it was rapturous and stylish and lovely and sweeping and romantic, and other people thought it was icky beyond all reason. It actually got a one-star review from the stage. I recently talked about it here on my channel. By this point, I should have uploaded a review video as well as a round up of all of the other reviews, so you can go and check out those if you want to know a little bit more about my perspective and some other critical perspectives on this show. It's certainly a divisive narrative, it's a controversial take on love and relationships. Like a handful of shows written in the 20th century, it doesn't necessarily pass the smell test when dragged into the 21st. But for the Andrew Lloyd Webber fans, this is must-see theatre, because we have these lush orchestrations on one of his most beloved scores. We have star of the original production, Michael Ball. I nearly called him Sir Michael Ball then. I'm getting very trigger-happy with these knighthoods. Michael Ball, who is playing George in this production, having played Alex in the original, but still getting to sing his famous song, Love Changes Everything. Now, Aspects of Love is certainly not often seen on stage. It hasn't really been majorly produced since the original production. There's been a UK tour, there's been 
off West End lives for this show, but this is a substantial West End return, motivated largely by Michael Ball's involvement. The show started previews on the 12th of May and is currently set to run until the 11th of November, and it might make that entire run with Michael Ball leading this cast. He might prove enough of a box office draw in spite of the very polarizing reviews. I don't know. It certainly hasn't had the glowing critical reception that the show might have hoped for. It's not a particularly well-known title among tourists, certainly not up against something like A Phantom of the Opera or some of the other shows I'm about to tell you about. So when I say The Wizard of Oz, you may not immediately think of Andrew Lloyd Webber, but just over a decade ago, he produced his own version of the show with a few new songs in the score at the London Palladium, and now it's going to return there to its original home. So this was a regional revival of the show produced at the wonderful Leicester Curve, and some of the cast members will be transferring with that production, while others have been replaced with slightly more well-known names. Georgina Onwara will be playing Dorothy Gale, and she is exceptional exceptional in this role. She has this incredible instrument of a voice that can sound both contemporary and classic. Fun fact, she was the alternate Cinderella when Cinderella first opened at the Gillian Lynn Theatre in the West End, and she is currently playing Ado Annie in Oklahoma at the Wyndham's. Range, I tell you, nothing but range. Joining her for this run will be beloved performer Gary Wilmot. He has been a mainstay of the London Palladium pantomimes for the last few years. He was recently seen as the wizard in Wicked, possibly making him the first actor or one of the first actors to play the Wizard of Oz in both The Wizard of Oz and Wicked. Someone can fact check me on that in the comments. And he was seen not too long ago in the London transfer of the revival of Anything Goes. Joining as the Scarecrow, the Tin Man and the Lion will be Louis Gaunt, Jason Manford and Ashley Banjo. I said those names the wrong way around. Ashley Banjo is the Tin Man, Jason Manford is the Lion. This is very confusing for me to wrap my head around, honestly, because I feel like you could rearrange those performers in a few of these roles, like Jason Manford could be playing the Wizard and I'd buy that that was happening. Louis Gaunt could be playing the Tin Man or the Scarecrow, but this is the way that it's been cast. Louis Gaunt is playing the Scarecrow. He was recently seen on the Palladium stage as Jack in Jack and the Beanstalk in their recent pantomime last Christmas. Previous to that, he filled in for Charlie Stemp to play Bert in the Western production of Mary Poppins. Louis is a wonderfully charismatic, very classic performer with tremendous dance talent, which is something we can also expect from Ashley Banjo. Now, he is making his musical theatre debut with this production and this role, but we have seen him before in pantomime as part of the popular group Diversity. Finally, comedian turned stage performer Jason Manford will be returning to the stage to play the Cowardly Lion, and I think he's going to be wonderful. Hilarious, he's got an actually genuinely very strong voice, and while I am sad for the tremendously talented performers who played these roles in the Leicester Curve production, I think that these three will also be very good. Now, if you're anything like me, you are very keen to know who will be playing the witches in this production. So Christina Bianco will also be returning to this show, having played Glyn at the Leicester Curve. She has a delightful take on this character with some lovely design elements. It's a very bold aesthetic reinterpretation of the show. I did review this at the Leicester Curve over Christmas if you want to hear a little bit more about why. And she will be feuding with the glorious Diane Pilkington, who will be adding another witch to her repertoire of roles. Diane was one of London's first Glinders in Wicked, and she will now be playing the Wicked Witch of the West instead. But recently she's been no stranger to a broomstick, because she played Eglantine Price in the UK tour of Bedknobs and Broomsticks. I'm a little bit devastated that it seems like Bed Knobs and Broomsticks is not going to transfer into a full West End run, but I'm equally happy to see Diane Pilkington flying around the West End where she belongs. Now, I've spoken a lot about Wicked, and The Wizard of Oz being back in town allows for a very fun two-show day. You can see The Wizard of Oz and Wicked both in London on the same day. The question to you is, which way round do you do it? Do you see Wicked and then The Wizard of Oz, because that's mostly the way that the plot flows, or do you see Wizard of Oz first and then go to Wicked like you're peeling back the curtain and re-examining everything that you thought you knew. I would opt for the second one, but I'm very intrigued to hear what you suggest in the comments down below. Next up, a show I did not think we were going to be talking about at all in London this year because it seems like Avita's going to be back in town. So I've been very aware about the gossip of a potentially impending Broadway revival of Avita. There is the production currently happening in the US that may be making its way to New York. But I was so distracted by that, I had not considered that there was going to be a concert staging of Avita at Theatre Royal Drury Lane. I'm going to read you a little bit from the press release. Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber's Evita returns to London's West End for special 
special concert performances. And there was a pre-sale for tickets that already started on the 19th of May, so if you're just now finding out about this and you desperately need tickets, pause me right now and go and buy them from lwtheaters.co.uk slash Avita. Honestly, they haven't even asked me to plug this, I just thought I'd help you out. So Tim Rice and Android Webber's Tony Award winning Avita returns to the West End this summer in an all-star concert at the iconic Theatre Royal Drury Lane. Remember that all-star phrasing, because I'm intrigued. Uh, and it's going to be accompanied by the 30-piece London Musical Theatre Orchestra, who I think are just fantastic. I've done a few uh, playthrough days with them before. They're a wonderful bunch. And very often, my favourite thing about a lot of these Android Webber productions will be the score. So to get to hear any of them with a 30-piece orchestra is a heck of a treat, especially in the glorious auditorium of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. If you haven't been there before and you don't know it, look it up. It's huge. It's currently where Frozen is playing in the West End, and they similarly hosted a few concert productions last summer. Trees Chess and Kinky Boots were all staged in concert last year at Theatre Royal Drury Lane. And if you'd like to watch my review videos of those, then you know where to find them. Honestly, I feel like I'm repeating myself. So Vita is going to play two performances, an evening performance on the 31st of July and a matinee performance on the 1st of August. It's going to be directed by Olivier Award winning director Bill Diemer with further creatives to be announced, but we do know two of the stars already. Auli Cravayo, the voice of Disney's Moana and recent star of Sunset Boulevard on stage, upcoming star of the Mean Girls movie. She's going to be playing Janet. If those three roles weren't already completely different enough for you, she's now going to be playing Ava Peron in a concert version of Avita. Now my first thought for this was she seems very young for the role, which is a, a trend in today's video as you'll find out, except for the fact that Ava Peron actually passed away relatively young, so I think having a younger and gutsy and determined and passionate uh, actress playing Ava Peron might be a very interesting take. She commented, I'm absolutely thrilled to be playing the beautiful role of Ava Peron in Evita, one of Angela Ed Webber's most iconic leading ladies. True, alongside such incredible West End talent. My heart is so full to be part of Evita in concert, held in one of the world's most famous theatres. This is a dream come true. Oh, I'm happy for her. Now, there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about how to cast Evita responsibly, because this is a story about an Argentinian political leader. And when the show was originally produced, it starred Elaine Page in the West End and Patti Lapone on Broadway, neither of them with Argentinian heritage. This was a trend that largely continued until Elena Roger played the role in a London revival in 2006, I believe, that then transferred to Broadway quite a few years later. As can be the case with this kind of casting, it was praised for its authenticity, but she was criticised for other areas of her performance, largely because she existed within the shadow of Elaine Page and Patti Lapone. If any of this is sounding a little bit like the recent Funny Girl discourse to you, then don't worry, because I heard it as well. There have been other productions since that have teased doing something a little more bold with the casting of Ava. There was a revival at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre not too long ago that featured a black actress on their initial marketing materials, though that was not reflective of the actress they then went on to hire. Actually, when I went to see that production, I saw the alternate Ava, Marsha Songkum. Marsha being an Asian performer, this is a colorblind interpretation of the role, and similarly the casting of Auli Cravaya would reflect that idea as well, because she is not Latin, she's not South American, she's not specifically Argentinian. Auli Cravaya, if you don't know, was born and raised in Hawaii, which I'm sure a lot of people will have a strong perspective on. I do think there's not really a wealth of Argentinian actresses in the UK, but I don't know, I haven't done a poll. Perhaps there are fantastic Argentinian actresses who ought to be given this opportunity. Ultimately, for this to be an all-star concert selling this kind of a venue, it does need to be a big name. I'm excited that we're getting Auli Cravayo starring in a production that's happening in London. That's very exciting, if completely out of left field. But ultimately, her youthfulness is the thing that's most intriguing me about this casting right now. Opposite her is going to be Matt Rawl playing Shay. Now, he starred opposite Elaine Roger in that previous Western revival that I was telling you about. So he's returning to the role of Shay almost two decades later. That's going to be very exciting, but you will remember they did also tease an all-star cast. Who are we going to get playing the mistress, considering she only has to come on stage to sing this one song, another suitcase in another hall? It, it could be anybody. We could get someone from the music or film world making their stage debut because they only have to do this one number. It's not like they have to do a tremendous amount of acting or dance or anything like that or commit to a very long run. Who's going to be playing Peron? Is it going to be this illustrious 
veteran actor. Honestly, I don't know how many more opportunities there are to cast starry names in this show because there aren't that many more parts that really have any kind of material. You have Augustin Magaldi as well. There's no obvious names springing to me right now, but I do think it would be fantastic if we could get some more Hispanic and Latinx representation within this cast because I do think that it's important. So Evita is not the only Angelo Webber musical coming to the West End in concert this summer. In fact, it's not the only one coming to Theatre Royal Drury Lane, because by the end of August, we're going to be seeing another one. Love Never Dies. Oh yes, it's happening. And apparently everyone other than me knew that this was being rumoured to return, because when I got this embargoed press release emailed to me, I nearly fell off of my chair. This very chair! So Love Never Dies was the comparatively ill-fated sequel to The Phantom of the Opera. It was produced, again, just over a decade ago at the Adelphi Theatre in the West End, and I went to see it. Insert a picture of me looking like a very excited child. I would have been 16 when that photo was taken. Interestingly, for anyone who has been following the saga of Cinderella and Bad Cinderella, Love Never Dies had a few similar things where they shut down the production for a brief period and reopened it with a couple of structural changes but also cosmetic changes. I think I saw it after those changes were made. They slowed down the tempo of one of Meg's songs, they put things in a different order, and they gave Ramin Karimlu, who was playing the Phantom, a black shirt rather than a white shirt. I should say, this show was also largely responsible for really launching Ramin Karimlu and Sierra Bogus as the huge musical theatre stars they have both become. And knowing Fourth Wall, who are producing this concert and also produced Bonnie and Clyde in concert last year, there's a part of me that wonders if their original hopes for this were to reunite those original stars, Sierra Bogus and Ramin Karimlu. He's in Funny Girl right now, but he did fly over not too long ago to perform Dr. Zhivago in concert in the West End, so anything is possible. So Love Never Dies didn't run a huge long time in the West End. It went on to have a production in Australia that was filmed professionally. If you've seen the DVD, that's the Australian production, not the original London one. And the show has yet to make any kind of a substantial UK return. The regional venue I told you about before, Leicester Curve, had announced a revival, but that was scuppered by the pandemic. But we're finally going to get to see the show again now. It's going to be performed on the 21st and 22nd of August at Theatre Royal Drury Lane. And wait till you hear who is starring in it. We have two incredibly talented performers who, like Ramin and Sierra, have both played these roles before in The Phantom of the Opera. Celinda Schoenmacher, which I'm hoping I pronounced correctly because my friend Danny told me I got it wrong last time. She is going to be playing Christine Daae. She's currently starring as Sarah Brown in the semi-immersive revival of Guys and Dolls at the Bridge Theatre and is one of the most versatile, talented, incredible performers I have ever seen. She will be joined by Broadway legend Norm Lewis, who made history when he played The Phantom on Broadway, becoming the first African-American actor to do so. He has this thing for coming over to the UK and performing in these huge concerts because he played Javert in the 25th anniversary concert of Les Mis. I'm so excited to see these two together and really on Norm's part, I'm excited to see what it does to the material to have an older actor playing this role because it's meant to be this time jump from the events of The Phantom of the Opera. So in the original production, we had leads who weren't cast too much older than they would be in Phantom. In fact, both of them went on to play the Phantom roles again after doing Love Never Dies. That makes no sense chronologically. Once again, this is being described in the press release as all-star casting. I don't know if that's PR spin or if that's a sign of things yet to come because we are still waiting to hear who is going to be Meg Giri, who plays a much bigger role in this plot than she does in Phantom. Also Madame Giri and Raoul. Very excited to hear the rest of the names and hopefully I will be seeing this production. I haven't yet made concrete plans to, but I'm really going to try and get there because I'm fascinated. Like I said, I got to see Love Never Dies when it was first in London. I am so intrigued to see it in concert. And I'm wondering, like with Bonnie and Clyde, are either of these concert productions going to go on to be a precursor to a fuller revival of the show? Are we going to see Love Never Dies perpetrating some kind of a serious return? I don't know. Now, the pre-sale again has already started Friday 26th of May. Tickets are available from 26th £7.50, again via LW Theatres, that's lwtheatres.co.uk forward slash love never dies. And finally, the recent announcement that nobody saw coming that sent all of us into a tailspin, Sunset Boulevard is coming back. But it's certainly not going to be a traditional production. Here is what we know. So this is going to be a big revival of Sunset Boulevard in the West End at the Savoy Theatre. This is going to be a fully staged production, it's not a concert. 
although it will be directed by Jamie Lloyd. So Jamie Lloyd is a director whose work you may know for various reasons. He directed that production of Evita I was telling you about before at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. It was very stylish, it was very striking visually, and he's known for that. Currently, his most well-known production is the revival of A Doll's House, starring Jessica Chastain on Broadway. And that production has been talked about and criticized in equal measure for its minimalist approach. Lots of amplification, lots of microphones very close to the mouth so that the actors can whisper and you can still hear it. And a relatively bare stage, except for this one giant turntable that has Jessica Chastain rotating around like she's in a microwave. Now, we don't know what Jamie Lloyd's version of Sunset Boulevard is going to look like. I would wager that it's going to be very non-traditional. I'm excited for it because he's a director I find very interesting, honestly. I don't think I've ever been to see anything by Jamie Lloyd that has ever left me bored. I trust him to do something bold and interesting and unique with this material, and I do suspect that there won't be much whispering in this because the leading lady has been announced. It's going to be Nicole Scherzinger. This is her return to Lloyd Webber musicals, despite the rumor that the two of them had a falling out a few years ago after she played Grizabella in the revival of Cats at the London Palladium. She is going to be playing Norma Desmond, and there was immediate criticism online that she was too young and glamorous to be playing the role of this faded, former silent movie star. Now let's do the maths on that together, shall we? So, Norma Desmond age. So according to Google, Norma Desmond is written as an inconceivably ancient figure. 50. Now, I do think 50 meant something very different in society then to what it means now, but let's look at the actresses who have played her in the past. Patti Lapone was how old when she starred in Sunset Boulevard originally? It was 1993, so Patti would have been in her early to mid 40s. Interesting. Now, if we look up Nicole Scherzinger's age, Nicole Scherzinger is 44. She'll be 45 by the time she plays the role. Perhaps because Glenn Close reprised her Tony Award winning performance as Norma Desmond years after originally playing the role, we have a slightly skewed perspective on how old Norma ought to be in the show. But honestly, I'm not really open to having these conversations that reduces an actress to just her age and her image. Firstly, there are many things that can be done with costuming and makeup to age a performer on stage to play a certain character, but I also don't think that this character's age is entirely fundamental to her portrayal. In fact, I think there are very interesting conversations to be had about the age at which Hollywood considers you to no longer be employable, to no longer consider you a viable star, and having a Norma Desmond who still looks a little bit younger and still looks glamorous might take us down some very interesting interesting pathways, some very interesting boulevards, dare I say. And if there's one person I trust to bring all of this vision together, it's Jamie Lloyd. Doubtless, he has a very different, very bold take on the show. We're not going to see traditional casting, not in his version. So I would encourage everyone who has been openly and loudly criticizing this casting to put down the musical theater pitchforks and refrain from commenting on whether you think an actress is old enough or faded looking enough to be able to play a certain role because that discourse leads to some very uncomfortable places. I've also seen a handful of people who have their reservations about this because Nicole Scherzinger has yet to deliver much of an acting performance. You know, she was in Cats, which is really more of just a vocal, and I think it's a foregone conclusion that she is absolutely going to hit these songs out of the park with, with one look, and as if we never said goodbye. I think the score is going to sound fantastic. I'm very intrigued about the performance that Jamie Lloyd can get out of her. I think if there's any director who is really going to take her to task on this, it will be him. I have faith in him and his creative vision. I am very intrigued to see what this Sunset Boulevard is going to look like. But those have been my thoughts on the Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals coming this year, and there might be more announced soon. At the bottom of that Sunset Boulevard press release, we got a little bit of a teaser. So, what we did know already was that Andrew Lloyd Webber was joining forces with producer Michael Harrison, and they have created Lloyd Webber Harrison musicals, which is something of a mouthful, but the logo is very stylish looking. It's the new company formed by composer Andrew Lloyd Webber and producer Michael Harrison to create and produce both new musicals and new productions from Andrew's existing catalogue of work. This show marks the company's first production, with the second to be announced in the autumn of 2023. And if I was a gambling man, I'd say maybe there are trains involved in something semi-immersive. We have been hearing rumblings for a while, rumblings that sound an awful lot like oncoming passenger trains. I think a Starlight Express revival might just be on the cards. But for now, there is plenty of fodder for musical theatre lovers and Andrew Lloyd Webber fans to enjoy in the West End. Six shows 
this year alone. I promised you at the beginning of this video a little bit of speculation as to why this might be happening, and while not all of them are being produced directly by Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber and his production company, they are being done so with his permission. They are being done so largely in venues that he owns. And if I were to speculate, I would suggest that this is perhaps a little bit of a goodwill PR campaign to repair his image after everything that happened with Cinderella and Bad Cinderella. His reputation has been unduly wounded recently with everything that's happened in New York, both with Phantom closing and with Bad Cinderella closing so soon after it opened and getting the reviews that it had. There is nothing like wheeling out all of his past hits to remind the theatre community that he once had this tremendous significance. And there's a lot to enjoy about all of this show, so honestly, I am not mad about it, and I'm probably going to be at most of them. And I'm very curious to hear if any of you will be doing the same. Which of these shows are you most excited to go and see in 2023. Let me know in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that you've enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. If you want to see my videos before everybody else and gain access to some exclusive content, then you can click on the link in the description and sign up to become one of my YouTube channel members. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>